independence produces a begrudging attitude. Holding on to grudges is devastating to your marriage. It's as though you keep a knife in your mind's pocket to twist when your husband makes a mistake or says something that reminds you of past battle scars. Let go of those grudges. Do you truly want to live as a couple whose marriage reflects Jesus' presence? Then release your rationalized distrust and guarded emotions against your husband. Withholding affection is one of those killer weapons that wives often use, and I'm speaking from sad experience here. It's not as though you've overtly sinned so that others can point out your transgression. Rather, your coolness mirrors the control you're exercising to retaliate or to manipulate your own way. My busyness in getting immersed in projects or activities might have been justified as helping others or being kind. But woe to Mike or to our son if they interfered with my gift preparations around Christmas time. My target fixation on making presents for our friends and relatives left the two most important people in my life feeling apprehensive and expendable. Please learn from my mistakes. The pain you bring your family by shoving them aside will never be compensated for by other people's thank yous. If you find yourself frazzled, stop. Reprioritize what's really important and will have long-term benefit to all of you. Discuss with your husband and family how you can glorify our Lord in a manner that doesn't rob your home of peace. Describe how you respond when your husband hurts your feelings. Do you ever find yourself so busy helping people outside your family that your husband or kids feel like second-class citizens? Are you willing to be changed? Independence fans flames of insubordination. Insubordination is a form of rebellion. It isn't defined by what you do do, but rather by what you fail to do or withhold out of disobedience. For instance, when Mike would correct or rebuke me, I'd retaliate by withholding a smile or a hug. It was hard for anyone to accuse me of sin because on the outside, I didn't do anything. But insubordination is one of the most serious sins we can commit. Mm -hmm. We're told that. Insubordination is like the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is demonic in origin. Witchcraft is the desire and the ability to manipulate things around you outside the will of God. Insubordination is a rebellious attitude that grows like a cancer. It causes you to act increasingly independent and even irrational. King Saul had such insubordinate disregard for God's law that he sought a witch for guidance. Insubordination is clinically called passive-aggressive behavior. In other words, you may be sitting down on the outside, but you're defiantly standing up for your own will on the inside. It's the worst of all prisons for people to try to help you out of. Because your most common response is, what did I do wrong? But your violation isn't what you did, but what you didn't do that's so heinous in our Lord's sight. Mm -hmm. A speaker at a spiritual warfare conference we attended referred to a Madonna spirit. This spirit is manifested when a married woman has children, then turns her devotion away from her husband to make her children the total focus of her affections. To her husband, she becomes like a Madonna, a mother rather than his wife. In response, he may then seek out a lover, someone who appreciates him. Paul warns both husbands and wives to not deprive each other of loving intimacy. Satan delights in dangling temptation in front of your husband if you substitute excuses for intimacy. When a husband is robbed of the affectionate deference due him by his wife, it may not be a sexual companion he's driven to. Maybe work or hobbies will increasingly keep him away from home. Only a humble yieldedness to cry out to our Lord in repentant trust can help an insubordinate woman. She must be willing to yield self on God's altar in order for Him to bring about the true heart changes. Those are the kind our Father knows are real 
and can overflow to her husband. Have you ever reduced your affection to control your husband? Do your children receive more attentive love than your husband does? Independence leads to usurping authority, and usurping authority ultimately leads to witchcraft. Have you ever noticed that when you try to follow an idea that's contrary to your husband's will or God's plan, you end up with an awful mess? Eve chose to act independently of God's commands and her husband's leadership. She foolishly placed herself in proximity of the forbidden tree and its tantalizing, luscious-looking fruit. Mm -hmm. Eve's independent action purposely strayed from the standard of righteousness that her Creator had given to both her and her husband for their good. As I mentioned earlier, Eve's independent attitude led her to rebel. She gave in to the temptation to be like God. Jumping out of her father's envelope of protection under Adam, Eve wanted life on her terms. Another woman of the Bible who walked forcefully in Eve's independence was Jezebel. She seized her husband's role and struck fear into a generation of men. Jezebel combined her power grab with witchcraft. In the process, she almost destroyed the prophets in Israel. Even Elijah fled in terror to hide from her wrath. Now what is there in Jezebel that we should beware? First, she devoted herself to idols, and she persecuted people who followed the one true God. You may not consider yourself idolatrous, but do you really trust and obey the one true God who has revealed Himself in His Word and by His Spirit? Are you at peace with God and what is going on around you? Do you walk with a quiet spirit that pleases our Lord Jesus in relationship to your husband? Or do your control and manipulation cause your family to fear getting on the wrong side of you? Jezebel was like many women today who exercise control by their independent attitude. She made decisions behind her husband's back and rationalized that it was for his good. You can read this sorry account in 1 Kings chapter 21. Ask yourself this. Do you try to manipulate your own way because you think you know what's best? Are you overlooking our father's plan of male headship in the process? Among the Navajo, it's traditional for a young girl to undergo the Kinalda ceremony when she begins menstruating. It's an initiation into womanhood. But the underlying goal for the ceremony is to establish the girl's right to authority as head of her home when she gets married. Sadly, too many of these girls see themselves as independent operators. They don't recognize their fathers as protector. Soon after initiation into womanhood, a girl becomes the target for hormonally driven young men looking for easy prey. These young ladies want to be accepted and feel good that someone's interested in them. But all too often these gals find themselves used and pregnant. Their sexuality becomes their means of control, a strategy that continues into marriage. Do you find intercourse with your husband an intimate expression of your loving gratefulness for him? Is intimacy a renewal of your marriage covenant for you? The faithful wounds of a friend. If you're married, maybe your life has come to the point of the manipulation that characterizes witchcraft. Or maybe you're walking in insubordination and withholding the affectionate deference you should be giving your husband. Either way, you need help. Intervention by your extended family and Jesus who care for you is essential. There is a vital relational need we have for someone who can get our attention and bring us up short. That's because they love us too much to see us stumble into foolishness and harm any longer. We're so grateful for a dear couple who are with us heart and soul. They go vertical on our behalf by praying earnestly and regularly for us. 
They share what our Lord has revealed so we can confirm it with His Word by His Spirit. Then we apply that confirmed Word to our lives. Let me share an example of how loving a timely word of rebuke can be. Mike had been laid low for four weeks with a sinus infection that spread to his lungs. It sapped his energy and even his ability to think. I gave way to my usual double time in getting things done, but found my empathy quotient about zero. Pausing to comfort and encourage him didn't even appear as a blip on my to-do list. But was all my work meeting Mike's real need? Or was I just feeling good about my competence, but exercising an independence that made him feel like an obligation? In response to their prayers, God told our intercessor friends what I was doing and why Mike's illness was lasting so long. We're both grateful that these prayer warriors delivered the wounds of a friend that bring conviction and a turnaround. Mike's extended illness turned out to be a classroom for me to exercise compassion and kindness, not to crank out chores. My behavior wasn't the issue. My unchristlikeness of heart in not coming alongside my husband was what our Lord wanted to be changed. Think about when your husband is undergoing difficulty or stress. Does anything in your life override affectionate interaction with him? Maybe this is when all those nasty little mental conversations crop up in your head of past hurts or irritations by your husband. Our Lord himself stressed that the second highest command is to love your neighbor. Just who do you think that first line of affection belongs to? The neighbor with whom you're in marriage covenant. Maybe you found substitutes for sharing affection with your husband. Obviously, your children do need your devotion, but your husband shouldn't have to wait for love leftovers. Just as in a Madonna situation, you can become so wrapped up in your children that your husband becomes another kid in your realm of responsibility. Or maybe you expect him to be a eunuch because you're so tired meeting everyone else's needs. Tragically, you may end up driving him into temptation elsewhere. If you have no children at home, maybe you're among the millions who lavish attention on your dog or cat. That strikes home with me. I found that our dog was always willing to show gratefulness for every little thing I did. He was always willing for me to cry on his neck without finding fault. While that seemed infinitely more soothing than showing love to the covenant partner who had just hurt me, I wasn't growing in Christlikeness by giving the dog my highest affection either. You may find that you're giving too much of yourself at work. Because you're bringing home a paycheck, you justify your fatigue and busyness as something your husband just has to live with. But our Father didn't intend it that way. Whatever the temptations you're facing, please ask for the prayerful support of people who will seek God's rhema, His guidance, on your behalf. It's not just a matter of someone saying a prayer for you. Your real need is for those who will sincerely come before God's throne, expecting His guidance on your behalf. Mike, in particular, senses the Spirit's call to lift up the people we care about, especially to help them keep out of trouble with our mm -hmm. Father. Do you have another woman who can speak correction into your life? Yes or no? If no, why don't you? Who displaces your husband in the affection realm? Is your affection unconditional, or does it depend on how you think he'll react? What would Jesus do? <laughs>